pelo Sclubinquiã, Isabel Mota. Muito boa tarde a todos. Começo por pedir desculpa deste uh, atraso, mas estava a acabar a reunião do Conselho de Administração e não podia mesmo, uh, não podia mesmo largar naquele momento, no momento em que seria pontual, não foi possível largar o Conselho. Mas estou aqui como te gosto. <coughs> Dear members of the International Panel on Social Progress, Dear member of the scientific uh, committee of the Gulbenkian Forum, um, dear uh, colleagues and uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure that in name of the board of trustees of the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation and myself, I welcome you all to uh, the presentation and discussion in Portugal of the report published by the International Panel on Social Progress. I'm happy to recall that uh, the Gulbenkian Foundation already hosted two years ago a uh, second <coughs> meeting, the second meeting of, the, of authors of the International Panel on Social Progress. The Gulbenkian Foundation has therefore taken a deep interest in the work of the, the panel from uh, the, be for the beginning uh, of its work, realizing that its aim and objectives were totally aligned with the goals of the Foundation. Namely, the commitment to contribute to the strengthening of the common good and to the establishment of a climate of dignity for all living beings on this planet. It is for this reason, reason, moreover, that this conference takes place within, within the scope of the newly created Gulbenkian Future Forum, which aims to identify, study, and disseminate knowledge about the disruptive challenge of our common future in collaboration with other European foundations and think tanks. And we have here Professor José Tavares, that is one of the members of, this, uh, of the scientific um, commission of this forum, and uh, he will address, the, uh, I think, immediately after <laughs> this, uh, this forum. The report, which uh, will be unveiled today, is full of good ideas and proposals for a better society. We all know that perfect systems of governance has been, have been devised along, along the centuries and some even <coughs> experimented. But social justice and progress have been elusive, maybe because they require a combination of a constructive vision with a clever formulation, reformulation of institutions and conventions, a stage which is never absolute or immutable, but rather always open to improvements as societies so evolve. When you look to the history of societies, we realize that the key battle for social progress is centered in drawing the lines of the rights of wealth. Nothing in society is natural, naturally given. Everything emerges as an institution shaped by norms and laws. This, the present effort to tackle these issues is thus of utmost importance. I very much thank the leaders of the International Panel for Social Progress that are present in this afternoon with us 
for the work and inspiration. And allow me to give a special word to João Carafa, um, who has been, since the beginning, an enthusiast and supporter of their work. To conclude, I wish you a fruitful debate that can contribute to make us all feel more at home in this planet, in peace, with dignity, and with more optimism to construct, construct our common future. The Gulbenkian Forum, Future Forum, will continue uh, to follow your work, and I hope that uh, we will have more opportunities to collaborate. Thank you very much. Ouviremos de seguida o representante da Comissão Científica do Fórum Gulbenkian em Futuro, José Tavares. Olá a todos. Em nome do Comitê de Científica do Fórum Gulbenkian em Futuro, eu gostaria de like convidar a esta conferência. Hoje vai ser devotada à apresentação e discussão do report publicado pelo Panel Internacional de Social Progress. I want to quote here a Portuguese artist, Almada Negreiros, that famously remarked, when I was born, all the sentences that one day will save humanity had already been written. There was only one thing left to do, to save humanity. Almada Negreiros was born in 1890, was, uh, born in 1993, so a long time ago, a lot of sentences. And Almada might have been right, but then maybe not. Actually, we are here already today to listen attentively. As put in the introduction to our panel meeting today, many ideas aiming at bettering society have been produced over the last centuries. Government, the law, ethics, all have been summoned in succession, sometimes overlapping, to better society, if not to make it perfect. New disciplines, social sciences, have emerged with great hopes of translating the scientific method into the betterment of society. We know it has not worked that well. The wars of the 20th century blatantly exposed our limitations as a species capable of continuous social improvement. We have learned a lot from utopias. Arguably, we have learned even more from dystopias. We are still learning. Social progress is prosperity, equity, and dignity, all three at least. And we need to protect social progress. I will argue we need to protect it from the money of the rich, possibly from the impatience of the poor. We need to protect it from the will of the majority as well as any overpowering minority. Protect it from the abusive power of monopolies and the possible abuse of power by governments and states. Protect it from the noise of social media and the complacency of traditional media. What does it mean to protect social progress? We spent too much time, probably, debating whether there is a viable alternative to the market system. Market institutions are necessary, but not sufficient, as pointed in the panel. It is likely that the alternative to capitalism is better capitalism. Better regulation, better government, better justice and equity. That is, better processes. Capitalism takes enough good care of prosperity, but not equity, maybe not even dignity. Democracy, the well-functioning kind, addresses the issue of equity. Education and culture are probably the best weapons to address 
dignity and tolerance for all. How do we protect social progress? I, I would argue by protecting the processes, the mechanisms. Good processes imply dense combinations of democracy, capitalism, and pluralism, all viewed as processes, processes that can be bettered. Justice and social progress come only with institutions, thoughtful, evolving, innovative institutions. I want to thank dearly all the leaders of the International Panel on Social Progress present here today. We look, we look forward to a thorough debate and illuminating discussions, and we yearn for contributions that will make us all live in a better, a fairer world, more peaceful societies in peace and at home in our planet. Rather than saving humanity, what we ultimately need is to better social processes. And for that, maybe, just maybe, we all need to do research, discuss and listen to each other much more. That's what we are here for, to listen. Thank you. Vai agora usar da palavra um dos criadores e coautores do painel internacional para o progresso social, Mark Florbey. So it is a great pleasure to uh, be back here in Lisbon after our last uh, meeting of the authors three years ago, uh, about exactly, and including in this room for one of the events. Um, and uh, President Mota was right to thank Joan Carassa because his influence is even perhaps greater than you know, because one of the first conversations that we had uh, in the very beginning, when the panel was just a vague idea, just a vague idea, was uh, Olivier and myself having dinner with Joan, and uh, I wanted to test uh, Joan's reaction about this idea, and his reaction was positive, and he has uh, stayed positive until now, I don't know about in a few minutes, but... Uh, <laughs> But, but if he had been, I can tell you, if he had been negative, probably the panel would not have existed. Uh, and so that was a very, very crucial conversations in the beginning. So let me uh, very briefly present, um, there will be a film after my talk, which will be more entertaining. Let me give you some um, features of this, of this work. Um, I wanted to show you this picture to insist on this human adventure, uh, which started with a dinner with Joanne, but uh, continued with 300 uh, scholars from all over the world and many disciplines in social science and the humanities um, from um, uh, really uh, diverse perspectives. Uh, it was hard sometimes to agree, but it was uh, always extremely uh, instructive. We've all learned from one another. That has been uh, uh, quite, uh, personally, I've learned so much from all of them. It has been a great honor to, to work with them. And I wanted to advertise that we don't uh, have just a report, which is a big uh, uh, volume, three volume book, which is extremely thick. Um, we also have uh, this uh, small book and we celebrate today the uh, translation of this small book in Portuguese, uh, thanks to uh, Gustavo Cardozo and, uh, and Caterina Foa, who is here. Um, and um, and uh, we also have a website on which uh, you can find a lot of resources. So essentially all the uh, basic documents, the drafts of the chapters, and a lot of other stuff is on the, uh, the website. So you have the uh, website address here, ipsp.org. You can find a lot of material uh, there, including if you teach, uh, you can uh, find some advice about how to use this material for, for teaching. Um, the objectives of this work, let me just briefly uh, mention why we did that. We wanted to uh, give a comprehensive coverage. We thought it was something that was necessary in our time, precisely because people have learned from dystopias, people have lost illusions, and it's a right time to think again. Uh, to take the situation anew and, and try to imagine how we can move forward instead of just falling into uh, discouragement and cynicism, as some people may if they, uh, if they abandon their illusions. And so we wanted to make up-to-date social science more available to people so that they can know that a lot has been done in the last uh, 60 years, 70 years. A lot has been done in social science, and this material is not necessarily easy with a lot of specialization, a big uh, corpus as a mast, and it's very hard for people to get access to it. So you have a sort of summary of key issues, key uh, elements of social uh, theories and facts 
in this report, and we are hoping that it will help people think and possibly act as well. Uh, many people now uh, take action in various ways, and we hope that it will uh, help them. We also were hoping that it would influence our own colleagues in academia, uh, making them more interested in thinking in terms of long-term perspective. What's the future of society? It's very easy when you are in academia to study the past, to study the present. It's much riskier to talk about the future, and we are hoping we could encourage more research into uh, future perspectives. So uh, I'll say a few words about the report and then a few, uh, a few more words about the book, the, the, the other book. So the report has these three volumes um, which cover almost everything. So when people ask me what, is, uh, what are the topics in the report, the answer is everything uh, in terms of social issues. So you have a discussion in the beginning about the broad uh, picture trends that we have and the question of what is social progress. That's a sort of old-fashioned term. Uh, that has somehow fallen into disrepute in certain corners. So we wanted to bring it back, but in a critical way. And so we discuss, uh, yeah, what is, uh, what is social progress? What should we be wishing for society? And then we have a first volume on socioeconomic transformations, discussing not just inequalities, but the future of work and, and a lot of things having to do with including uh, urbanism and, and all of that. Um, we have a volume, a second volume on governance because governance is really key. Uh, sometimes people ask me what is in a one sentence the key elements that uh, matter for social progress. I always say it's three things, power, power, and power. Uh, because really uh, processes, as was said in the introduction by Jose, uh, processes are very important and the distribution of power is, uh, is key to uh, the processes of decision. And uh, so this uh, second volume studies the evolution of democracy, rule of law, and the media, and all that in, in, this, uh, in this setting. And then we have a third volume, which is perhaps a bit surprising for people like me who are uh, coming from economics, but it's actually something I really believe is extremely important. Um, culture and evolutions in values and what makes the, uh, uh, the fabric of social relations in society uh, this is the topic of the third volume, and uh, we look at the evolution of, of things having to do with the concept of modernity and how this is lived by people, religion, families, health issues, and health is not just a technical issue or, or a socioeconomic issue, it's also about how we see life, what is uh, living, what is dying, what is uh, being born, and all that. And finally, uh, we have a chapter at the end which discusses uh, ideas, utopian ideas, new utopias, uh, which hopefully will be less destructive than the old utopias of the 20th century. Um, hopefully we've been vaccinated by what happened in the 20th century, and these utopias that we discuss are, uh, will not be as lethal as, uh, as them, will not be lethal at all, that's the hope. Um, so um, this is very brief, and uh, I'm sorry, this is three big volumes, I'm very short of that. Uh, you can have a look at our website to get more information. Let me say a few more words about this book, this little book, which we wrote. Uh, the motivation for this little book was to make the whole thing more accessible, but also to be a bit more daring than our authors in the report, because the authors were very careful. They wanted to discuss the, the existing literature, and they didn't venture too much in imagining different things. Um, and so we tried to build a narrative in a small team out of the report, but going a little bit beyond it, with this goal of uh, discussing what kind of vision we can have for the future of society. And wh when we think about uh, what can bring change and positive change in society, of course we can talk about political processes and things like that, but really if people have no vision, nothing will happen or nothing good will happen. And so first we should start with having a vision, and this is the topic of this book, try to propose a vision. So let me uh, very quickly go through some of the chapters and give you an idea of what you, you'll find in this book. Um, so I only had the uh, picture of the book in English. I didn't have the beautiful uh, cover of the book in uh, Portuguese, so if someone could show it, it's much better than the one in English, so uh, thank you for those who did it. Um, and, um, and so let me, let me uh, in a few minutes, uh, go through th some of the topics. So we have two parts in this book. The first is really looking at the trends uh, and uh, the perspectives from where we are now. And the second part is looking at what we could change, how we could imagine changing things. So the first chapter is really looking at uh, something that people who are critical about the situation of society tend to forget. We live in actually 
one of the best times of humanity. Things have never been so good as they are now. There has been considerable progress in terms of not just economic development, but improvements in health, uh, the spread of democracy over the world. I mean, this period is better than any previous period in many ways, and we tend to forget that when we look at the immediate problems we have. But at the same time, indeed, problems are appearing, and these problems are threatening all the achievements that we have. Um, and they are threatening to, we have, we have almost eliminated poverty in the world, extreme poverty, not, not quite, but now it's, it's really amazing what we've done in a few decades. And all that could unravel if things go badly. We have threats appearing, not just in the uh, economic sphere with inequalities, but also on the environmental uh, front with the climate change and other uh, things like biodiversity loss. And we have political problems, democracies. I, I was talking about the spread of democracies, but democracies are struggling. And now uh, we see that many of the old democracies seem to be uh, shaking on their foundations. Uh, and so we have to be worried about that. The second chapter discusses uh, these big things that people always talk about, technological change, globalization. And they are indeed big factors, big drivers of the changes. But something that tends to be forgotten is that these drivers are actually shaped by policies, they are shaped by decisions, and they could be made uh, different. They could be changed. Globalization has been pushed in one direction, which has been a lot about letting capital move freely and a lot about protecting investments and this sort of thing, and much less about uh, letting people move freely and much less about making sure that the disruption coming from trade is not harming some people in various places in, in the world. And so we can really rethink, and same for technology. Technological change can be great at cutting costs, uh, but it can also be uh, problematic when this means losing jobs uh, and people losing their social status, so we have to be careful about that. And social pro so technical progress could also be used for, for improving uh, social relations instead of cutting people off when they face a machine instead of facing a real person uh, when they do something with the administration or with the bank or, or whatnot. Um, the third chapter is, is the kind of rosy chapter in the discussion of trends. It looks at the evolution of values, and believe it or not, at a time when we see um, a re-emergence of xenophobia and nationalism and this sort of thing, we've never been in such a tolerant period in the, in the, in the history of humanity. Um, we have a, a lot of respect for people coming from different ethnicities, uh, different background, different uh, sexual orientation. Of course, all of that is still contested and there are still problems, but, uh, but it's much better. And if you look at the long run evolution, it seems to be going definitely in the right direction of greater respect for people, greater tolerance. Including, so I was talking about among human beings, but also including about nature and other species. Uh, I've seen that you have in Portugal a party for animals, so I don't want to uh, advocate for this party. But this is part of a trend of a great, greater respect for uh, various species. Uh, and this evolution, we see that everywhere. Um, and then this uh, first part ends with uh, a sort of puzzle. Um, because of the dangers, and I've listed the problems we are facing with inequalities, with environmental uh, degradation, and with problems with uh, um, law and order and, and uh, democracy, uh, we face a big challenge, the, which is that we need to address these three, these three sorts of challenges at the same time. If we fail on one of them, we will fail uh, on, on the rest. And so, uh, in this chapter, we explore scenarios, we build scenarios of the future where we invest in, in some of these challenges, but we fail on one, and then everything unravels. Um, when we wrote that, it was already about uh, two, more than two years ago now when we started writing that. Um, unfortunately, uh, it looks like the three scenarios we have built are not the scenario we are living in now. What we are seeing, what we are witnessing, seems to be that we are failing on the three dimensions at the same time. And so the situation is actually worse than we imagine in this book. Um, but still, uh, it's instructive to look at, um, at, at these various ways in which we can, we can fail. And so if we don't want to fail, what should we do? And that's the question that uh, the second part is asking. So uh, here comes the uh, a little bit more utopian uh, vision. 
But our goal is not to be utopian in the wrong, in the negative sense, but utopian in the positive sense of uh, imagining uh, how things could be, uh, how things could be uh, different. And uh, chapter five, in search of a new third way, so you've, I guess you've all heard about the third way, which was this neither capitalism nor socialism, but something in between. Um, in our report, there is indeed, and, uh, and uh, Jose uh, said it, uh, we, we have this uh, uh, acknowledgement, acceptance that the market is with us and will stay with us. So we have to abandon the illusion of radically changing the economy. And so that's something that we embrace in this part. But nevertheless, uh, we, we may have to change some of our ways of thinking. And one of these things that we should do is to go beyond a strictly economistic way of thinking about uh, inequalities, which is inequality about the distribution of income and wealth and this sort of thing. Uh, Isabel Mota mentioned that the key issue is the defining the rights of wealth. And indeed, uh, it's these things that have to do with rights and power and, and decision-making processes that are key. And so we need to incorporate that in our analysis. Another point that this chapter makes is that uh, if you go in that direction of thinking a little less about just economic inequalities, but also about inequalities of power and status and dignity, um, you have to look not just at the big institutions. Uh, people tend to always focus about the markets and the government policies and this sort of thing. But where do people spend their time? They spend their time in their family, in their neighborhood, and in their workplace. And so. Uh, that's where the action is if you want to uh, change people's life for the better. Uh, we have to look at what's happening there. And in each of these places and institutions, you have issues of inequalities of resources, but also inequalities of power and status uh, and dignity. Um, and so if we want to uh, use this uh, kind of toolkit and apply it to the institutions, what uh, the, the institutions we have now, what should we do? So we have these three chapters that discuss capitalism, I mean the market economy, that discuss the welfare state, and that discuss the, um, uh, the political system. So on capitalism, um, the, there are a couple of key things. One is, of course, uh, what's going on in the market economy in the standard way is important, and we've seen a lot of concentration uh, of market, uh, market power in big firms, uh, that this has been happening uh, all over the world. Um, and this is problematic for various reasons, but this seems to be well established now, even though there are still some quarrels about whether some concentration might be beneficial to some extent because of new technologies and, and various uh, economies of scale. But nevertheless, we have a problem on this front, so we should uh, somehow fight for restoring competition, right? So that sounds very kind of classical and, and very basic, but, but there, is, uh, there is some social progress fight to have toward, toward better competition. Um, but the other thing is uh, the, what happens, and as I said, people spend a lot of time in their workplace. What's happening in uh, corporations, in productive firms is important, um, and reforming the corporation is, is a very important thing to do at the moment. And this is being discussed. Um, you have, including in the business world, you have evolution. Uh, you may have heard about the US Business Roundtable, which uh, had a new statement of uh, purpose, uh, going away from the shareholder value and saying that they are committed to all of their stakeholders, and stakeholders include their customers, their suppliers, their workers, and the local communities, and also the environment. And so, the evolution of the purpose of the corporation has to be accompanied with an evolution of the governance of the corporation, and that's much harder, because when you touch power, then people start to resist the change. Um, and it has also to change the uh, reporting uh, of the, the, evolution of the, the evaluation of the performance of the firms. And so that's, um, that's the key elements of this uh, reform capitalism chapter. Uh, look at what's happening inside the firms and not just uh, in the market. The welfare state chapter is saying perhaps we should go beyond that. The welfare state was, we don't want to be negative about the welfare state. The welfare state has been doing a great job at protecting people and is, will always be necessary because, because the market economy is always a risky, risky activity. You can never guarantee people's income and jobs in the market economy. Things always change, move, and so uh, you need some protection and the welfare state is there for that kind of thing. But this is not enough. And the point is that the welfare state now, the, the state has to move toward 
key actions that are needed. And so one of these actions is precisely to implement the change in the uh, distribution of power in the economy, the democratization of firms that is needed. This has to be mandated by law. It cannot happen. Corporate social responsibility can all go, only go so far. Goodwill uh, in the business world is, uh, is always challenged by some uh, less scrupulous actors. And so uh, we need to have some intervention of the state for that. And the state also can uh, redirect its taxation away from the taxes that discourage labor and investment and all that, and toward more taxes that uh, protect the environment, for instance, right? So if we had aggressive carbon taxes and various things like that, we could raise new revenues, and uh, studies have shown that this could be substantial. It cannot replace everything, but it could be substantial and help, um, and help uh, use uh, revenues for good purposes. But also these taxes, what's good about them is that instead of being distortionary, which means that they create inefficiency in the economy, they would actually restore efficiency. They would make uh, private agents be more conscious about uh, the effect of what they do. Uh, it would make them internalize their uh, effects, especially on the environment. So that's uh, what we say about the welfare state. And this idea of the emancipating state is, is the idea of really helping people becoming independent, autonomous, uh, having more freedom because they are given rights uh, in, uh, through especially the democratization of the, of the economy. Um, and finally, uh, polarities and politics. So polarization is a big worry in various countries. I live in the US now. It's awful. People treat the people from the other party as enemies. Really, they use these words. They use the word traitors, this sort of thing. So, um, so polarization is really uh, very bad in certain countries. And in Europe, we see similar trends in many countries. It seems that Portugal is preserved from that. Uh, please keep it as long as possible. Uh, but, um, but the situation is very worrisome. And so what should we change in that respect? Um, well, there are a couple of things we should, we should think of. The first one is the influence of money in politics. Um, money, uh, there will always be inequalities in uh, the economy, but when these inequalities are transferred to inequalities in power, greater access to political processes, uh, when rich people can buy politicians, uh, things are, are not going well. And so the fact that many people feel disenfranchised has been proved by political scientists to be essentially correct. They are disenfranchised because the decisions are not taken in the interest of the average person. They are taken in the interest of the elite that has access to these channels of power. And money is a big part of that. It's not just money, but it's, it's part of that. Um, the other big thing that we need to look at is, and we have a specialist here, is communication. The media and the social media, uh, this is something that is not an ordinary business. Right? It is unfortunately uh, treated uh, like that, but it should be treated more like a public good that has a special function to uh, provide for a good democratic debate, a good uh, set of deliberations uh, among citizens. And this is something that is uh, extremely important to tackle. Uh, there are no easy solutions in this respect, but it's important to, to start working on that. And finally, uh, there are many countries where the rules, the electoral rules and the way the, uh, the rules of the political system are designed are just very bad. So you now have many countries, and again I could speak about the US, where the people in charge represent a small minority of the population. They have been elected by a small minority because the uh, rules of the game, the rules of the electoral system are not, are not correct and give ext uh, an extra weight to people who are not really representative of the population, and that's, that's a big uh, problem. So let me uh, conclude by mentioning what we have in our concluding chapter. So a big question that is not fully addressed, I must say, in the report, not fully uh, solved, is where will the change come from? Who are the actors that will push for the change? And um, this is not an easy answer because unlike the 20th century where there were some big social movements and everybody was looking at them, we no longer have something like that now. And so we need to think of, uh, of a, a wider set of actors. Civil society organizations seem to be playing a big role. And perhaps that's where we should put our hope uh, nowadays, more than in old organizations like political parties and, and this sort of thing. Um, and so um, mobilizing change makers may go through mobilizing and 
also elevating the level of coordination and influence of civil society organizations, among other things. And our, in our uh, book, we ask the question, what can you do if you are a reader of this book? Can you find ideas, uh, that, uh, things that you could do in your life that would help changing things? And we give a list of ideas. You can change things in your family. Uh, and uh, I won't go through many examples that we can do, but you can even, uh, easily guess what that means in terms of sharing work uh, more and so on. You can uh, bring change in your workplace. You can bring change in your uh, consumption and saving investment choices. You can also look at your local community. Now, uh, staying informed, I go back to communication, staying informed has become a sort of militant act. It's, it's hard to stay informed, and so it's part of uh, the uh, duties that we should all feel as citizens. And finally, we have to recognize that what everyone can do is limited. And so at some point, we have to go through the political process. And so being an active citizen and help uh, obtaining change in the political decisions is uh, something we cannot, uh, we cannot do away with. We have to go through that because we need good laws, especially to bring these uh, good processes that we were talking about uh, to uh, redefine the rights of wealth that we, uh, we heard about. So all that has to come at some point from politics, unfortunately. It would be easier if uh, it could just be individual action. No, uh, it cannot just be that. And sometimes we are criticized that this chapter is rosy and says everyone can change. No, we don't say that. We say actually the last item is extremely important and we have to go through these processes. Okay, I hope I've not been too, uh, too long, uh, but probably I have. Uh, so I don't know if we have time for Q&As, perhaps not, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps my job then is to introduce in a few words the, the film. Is that what I should do now? Yeah. So um, you'll now watch a movie, a documentary about uh, the uh, report. So it's a, it's a movie that has been done. It's an independent work that has been done by a very young journalist who has been working with us a little bit in the beginning. And then she decided she wanted to do her first film. And she's done that on, on, on us. Um, and so uh, she is showing both some of our ideas and some of our members, uh, including in their personal surroundings. So I told you this was a human adventure, uh, starting with a conversation with Joanne, and, uh, but also involving many people for whom their research on social progress goes together with, uh, with life uh, and sometimes with activism in various, in various ways. Um, and so this is what the movie presents. Independent work, uh, this was not commissioned by us in any way or controlled by us, so we don't feel responsible for the content, but it's, it's really uh, something that uh, gives an idea of what we've been doing and what kind of uh, uh, nice people we have in our, in our group. Thank you very much. <laughs>